we are going to going to be reacting to another top 5 video so this is the murderous mind series i have done some episodes of murderous mind series so you can check it out i'll link it up there all of them i made a playlist called top 5 you will all be in there as you read in the title this video is about dr harold shipman serial killer documentary all right let's watch this this is a doctor dr harold shipman was to his patients the perfect GP, kind, caring, trustworthy. He doesn't seem like a person to kill. Always willing to visit his many patients in the comfort of their homes. He was held in such high esteem that those that made it onto his patient list likened it to winning the lottery. But the truth was that this kindly looking doctor was relentlessly picking them off, deciding when it was their time to die. And at the height of his murderous reign, he was killing at least one patient every week by injecting week. them with a fatal dose of morphine. Over a period of 20 morphine. years, it's estimated he took the lives of at least 250 of his patients. Jeez, that's Not a lot. Not by mistake or as mercy killing. When was this occurred? I think it was per recent. But in a cold, calculated act of murder. Here we look at the life of Dr. Harold Shipman, one of the most prolific serial killers the UK has ever seen. He's from UK. Right, I'll skip the intro. Ali Lab. Harold Frederick Shipman was born on the 14th of January 1946 in Nottingham, England, and was the middle child of devout Methodist Vera and Harold Shipman. He had an older sister Pauline and a younger brother Clive. Shipman's father was a HGV driver, and despite the family's fairly humble lifestyle, his mother believed her family, and in particular her children, were far superior to others in the neighborhood, a okay. belief she instilled into all of them. But it was Harold, her favorite child, who was singled out from his siblings and who from an early age was dominated by his mother. She controlled every aspect of his life, even dictating what he wore and the friends he had. Jeez. This sense of superiority well, that was taking to part. meant the shipman was often isolated from his peers and had few friends. And the expectations his mother had put on him put undue pressure on the young Harold. Despite this, during his first years at school, he excelled. Although he did find it tough when he reached higher education, only attaining mediocre grades. One thing he was able to sustain was his arrogance and air of superiority. And although he was a good footballer and athlete, he still struggled to form any meaningful friendships. Life for young okay. Harold was about to change. His beloved mother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and Damn. Harold devoted all of his spare time to caring for her, spending hours holding her hand and talking to her as she lay stricken in bed. It was during this time that he became fascinated with morphine after witnessing the relief his mother felt after she was injected with the drug. All her pain was relieved. That's not looking good already. The dose reignited her energy, briefly giving him back the mother he adored. This had a profound impact on Harold and is thought to have influenced his murderous actions later in his life. On the 21st of June 1963, when Shipman was just 17 years old, his mother died. Outwardly, oh no. he didn't appear to grieve for her and carried on life as if nothing had happened. But her passing is believed to have been the reason he became determined to go to medical school and study to become a doctor. And at the age of 19, he was awarded a scholarship to Leeds School of Medicine. Okay. During his time in Leeds, he met his future wife, Primrose May Oxtoby. At the age of 17, Primrose fell pregnant, and just over five months later, on the 5th of November, 1966, was she and Harold married. Shipman graduated from med school in 1970 and interned at Pontefract General Infirmary for four years. Until 1974, he took a position as a GP at Abraham Ormrod Medical Center in Todd Morden, West Yorkshire. By this time, Primrose had given birth to their second child. For the first time, Shipman's hard work and enthusiasm enabled him to fit in well, and he was respected and liked by his peers. After that, what happened to him? His up-to-date medical practices were viewed as a godsend. But just a year later, Shipman started to suffer blackouts. He lied to his colleagues, saying that he had epilepsy, but in reality, he had become addicted to pethidine, 
a synthetic form of morphine, and he was regularly prescribing the drug under a series of false names for his own use. Jeez. The truth finally emerged when the practice receptionist noticed discrepancies on the drug ledger and alerted the senior practitioners. A web of lies was uncovered, and when the partners confronted Shipman, he flew into an uncontrolled rage, behavior that was totally out of character for the normally composed doctor. It was later discovered he had fraudulently obtained enough morphine to kill 360 people. Jeez. It was during his time working at Todd Morden that Shipman killed his first known victim. Her name was Eva Lyons. She died on the 17th of March, 1975, on the eve of her 71st birthday. Around 30 minutes after, Shipman administered a lethal injection of diamorphine in the presence of her devoted husband, Dick, who at the time was blissfully unaware that he had just witnessed his wife's murder. Jeez, well, that was actually very scary. Similar to his own mother, Eve had terminal cancer, and Shipman may have seen it as a mercy killing. Whatever his reasons, it was the start of a murderous reign that wouldn't be stopped for a further 23 years. 23? Shipman was dismissed from the practice and fined £600, but the GMC took no further action against him. Only £600 and he's gone. He was sent a strongly worded letter and was free to carry on practicing as a GP. This was a vital mistake because if action had been taken, any further employer would have been aware of his misdemeanors and many lives may have been saved. Yeah. After his dismissal, Shipman briefly attended a drug rehabilitation clinic in York, but for a short stint serving as a medical officer, as well as some temporary work for the National Coal Board. In 1977, Shipman secured a position as a GP at the Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, near Manchester. By this time, he had four children, Again, he was well received by his colleagues, and despite the senior partners being aware of his misconduct in his previous post, mm. they believed him when he said he had addressed his problems and was now clean. Deadly. And despite his admission of drug misuse, he was still given unsupervised access to controlled substances. But as time oh went on, cracks began to show in Shipman's personality. And despite the fact that his patients had complete trust in what they saw as a kind and hardworking GP, he had become known for being rude and sarcastic to his juniors and only turning on the charm with those he wanted to impress. Throughout the 1980s, Shipman continued working as a GP and became a particular favorite with his older patients because of his willingness to do home visits. Little did they know that by the time he left Donnybrook Medical Center in 1992, after falling out with his partners, mm -hmm. he had killed at least 74 elderly patients, possibly Jeez. more. In 1993, That's a lot of people. he set up on his own at 21 Market Street, Hyde, Greater Manchester, in a new practice where he employed his wife Primrose as a part-time receptionist. He attracted a large number of patients who followed him from Donnybrook. This was due to his expert bedside manner with the elderly and the unwavering love and trust they had in him as their doctor. However, for his patients, Shipman setting up on his own was a deadly move. He was now away from the prying eyes of colleagues and was free to do exactly what he wanted. It wasn't until early 1998 that local undertakers had become alarmed at the number of people who were dying under the care of Shipman. They also noticed that most of the dead were elderly women who were found in their own homes, either sitting in an armchair or lying on their beds, fully clothed and seemingly comfortable. Unusual positions for most people to die. Around the same time, Doctors at the neighboring Brook Surgery were also becoming concerned about the number of cremation forms they were being asked to sign by Shipman. How did all the doctors didn't notice he was killing? As is required by British law, a doctor from an unrelated practice was required to countersign the cremation forms issued by the deceased doctor. In light of these concerns, they did a bit of investigating themselves and discovered that in 1997 alone, 41 of Shipman's elderly patients had died at home. 41. And one of them had been cremated. This equated to a 10 times higher death rate with his patients compared to theirs. In fact, they became so suspicious that they reported the matter to the local coroner who notified the police. But incredibly, the police investigation failed to check even the most basic information. They didn't interview Shipman or the relatives of the deceased okay. and failed to contact the GMC, who would have revealed Shipman's previous misconduct. Instead, they were yeah, police were so stupid back then. On medical notes of the 19 patients that had recently died, 
the very notes that Shipman had forged to make the deaths look genuine. This crucial mistake cost the lives of a further three patients. Mm. On June the 24th, 1998, former mayoress of Hyde, Kathleen Grundy, was found dead at her home. Her family had been alerted when she failed to show up at an age concern club that she regularly attended. Despite the fact that Kathleen Grundy was 81, her death was a shock to everyone who knew her, as she was fit and healthy and led an active life in the community. In fact, she was so energetic that many believed she had many more years left to live. It was known that Shipman had visited her just hours earlier and he was the last person to see her alive. Mm. He claimed he had visited the pensioner to take blood for a study he was doing on aging. This was a complete lie and when Shipman told Kathleen's daughter, Angela Woodruff, that a post-mortem was not necessary, she became a little suspicious. Yep. Unlike many of Shipman's victims, Kathleen was buried, not cremated. And it was shortly after the funeral that alarm bells started ringing for her family, when it was revealed that her entire estate, amounting to £380,000, had been left to Dr. Shipman. Angela, who was a solicitor, asked to examine the will, and she immediately noticed glaring discrepancies in the wording, and she believed her mother's signature had been forged. In fact, the whole document seemed amateurish, and she immediately became suspicious and called the police. Shipman was arrested on September the 7th, 1998, okay, and was held at Ashton Underline Police Station, where he was questioned about the death of Mrs. Grundy. Throughout the questioning, Shipman was dismissive and rude, and even suggested that 81-year-old Mrs. Grundy was a drug user. But the full extent of Shipman's crimes was beginning to unfold, and it wasn't long before Greater Manchester Police were involved in the biggest mass murder investigation in United Kingdom's history. During the course of the inquiry, a further 11 bodies were exhumed, and it quickly became apparent that there was a reoccurring theme with all of his victims. Most of them lived alone and had usually visited Shipman at his surgery shortly before they died. Mm. They would then receive an unexpected visit from him in their own homes, usually in the afternoon. But despite the surprise visit, they all trusted him enough to invite him in for a cup of tea. Okay. After administering a lethal injection of morphine, usually under the pretense of taking a blood sample, he would then make them look comfortable, either sat in an armchair or placed on their bed. They were always fully clothed, and there was no suggestion that Shipman ever molested any of his victims. Shortly after killing them, he would alter their medical notes to ensure that his account matched the historical records. Another pattern to his murders was that he would often return to his victim's home, knowing he would discover them dead and alert the authorities. Jeez. And on many occasions, he would send their relatives pre-printed and unsigned sympathy cards. He also liked to return to the same street in search of new victims, sometimes even the same house. It's thought that Shipman killed twice at number two Leafold Hyde, first Alice Gorton, 76, who died there on August the 10th, 1979. And then nine years later, on February the 15th, 1988, Jane Jones, who was 83 and was found dead in the same house. In most cases, his this might still be occurring today and we don't even know. Murders ...were not an act of mercy, as many initially thought, as the majority of his victims were not even ill. Finally, the police charged Shipman with 15 individual counts of murder, as well as one count of forgery. Shipman's trial began on October the 5th, 1999, at Preston Crown Court. The prosecution yeah, stated... Trial that Shipman had killed because he enjoyed exercising control over life and death, and rejected any claims that he had been acting out of compassion. Angela Woodruff was a key witness, and her account of the events leading up to and after her mother's death was crucial. And her statement was corroborated by fingerprint analysis that confirmed the mother's altered will was a crude forgery typed up on a typewriter found in Shipman's home, and that her mother had never handled the document. Computer analysis confirm that patients' medical records had been altered within hours of their deaths. As the trial progressed, it also came to light the lack of compassion Shipman showed to the relatives of the deceased. He was always reluctant to attempt revivals of his patients, and often he would pretend to call emergency services in the presence of relatives, knowing their loved ones were already dead, although records showed no actual calls were ever made. 
Then there was the overwhelming evidence of drug hoarding. Shipman was consistently false prescribing morphine to his patients and over prescribing to others, collecting the drugs himself to use as his poison. Jeez. Throughout the proceedings, Shipman remained arrogant and haughty. He constantly changed his story and was far from the caring doctor his devoted patients portrayed. After hearing all the evidence, the jury was sufficiently convinced of Shipman's guilt and unanimously found him guilty on all charges, 15 counts of murder and one of forgery. The judge passed 15 life sentences as well as a four-year sentence for forgery, Are you all wearing a wig? which he commuted to a whole life term, removing any possibility that Shipman would be released. Neither Shipman or his wife Primrose showed any emotion when the verdict and sentencing were read out. Shipman became the only British doctor in the country's legal history to be convicted of murdering his patients, although he was only found guilty of killing 15. This was because, in light of the publicity surrounding his first trial, any subsequent trials would not be fair, and given his whole life sentence would make no difference to his punishment, these additional deaths would be dealt with separately. After in the aftermath of the trial, various inquiries and audits were carried out on Shipman's patients, and the overwhelming verdict was that it was likely he killed at least 236 of his patients. The majority of these were killed between 1975 and 1998. However, there was a likelihood that he started murdering his patients as far back as 1971, Damn. shortly after he obtained his medical license. But due to insufficient evidence and records, this has never been officially proven. Most of his victims were elderly women who lived alone, but he also killed men, and his youngest confirmed victim was in fact a 41-year-old man. What do I he mean? was also suspected of killing four-year-old Susie Garfit in 1972, who although was gravely ill, died unexpectedly while under Shipman's care at Pontefract General Infirmary. It was concluded that all of his victims died peacefully in the comfort of their own homes, except for one who he killed at his surgery. After death, he always rejected a post-mortem and urged the families to cremate their loved ones, although on some occasions this didn't happen. Although it's not thought money was ever a motive, over £10,000 worth of jewellery was found in the garage of the family home, okay. jewellery that Primrose was very reluctant to hand back. Unlike other serial killers, Shipman didn't appear to have a motive for his mass killing. Although it's been suggested that he disliked older women, and thought the elderly in general were a drain on the health service. Jeez. Others think he was recreating the death of his beloved mother. Whatever the reason, Shipman would never reveal it, and he and his family, well, this mess up. his devoted wife Primrose, always believed he was not guilty, despite the overwhelming evidence proving he was. Throughout his incarceration, Shipman protested his innocence and never apologised or showed any signs of remorse for his actions. His wife visited him as often as she was allowed, and the pair exchanged numerous love letters. Witnesses who observed their visits said the couple chatted and held hands like a couple of love-struck teenagers. Such was Primrose's devotion to her husband that many questioned whether she knew about his killing. It turns out there is absolutely no evidence to suggest she was aware of anything. In fact, she was so blinded by her love for him that it's thought she had plunged into a psychological denial and was unable to accept his guilt. In June 2003, Shipman was moved from Durham Prison to Wakefield Prison, one of England's most notorious jails, okay. nicknamed Monster Mansion, and it houses some of Britain's vilest criminals. Harold Shipman thought he was far too good for that place. On January the 13th, 2004, on the eve of his 58th birthday, Shipman hanged himself in his cell using his bedsheet. Really? The British tabloids were jubilant about the death of the man they had dubbed Dr. Death. But for his victims' families, this felt like an easy way out for him. A cowardice act that, that deprived them of an explanation as to why he murdered their loved ones. And in a final calculated twist, it was revealed Shipman timed his suicide so that his wife would receive the maximum £100,000 pension payout. Really? If he had waited until after his 60th birthday, this would have been drastically reduced. So it seems that right until the end, Shipman had control. And as he had with over 250 others, he chose when it was time to die. Damn. Although this documentary...
when when he's about to die he still wants money it was not the most gruesome in many ways it was the most chilling it revealed a silent killer an unlikely killer a man who was trusted and loved by those who knew him and who happily invited him into their homes blissfully unaware that he intended to murder them even willingly offering their arm out for their assassin to administer his fatal injection after all who can you trust if you can't even trust your doctor yep that's scary i guess we can't trust no one this was an interesting episode to watching this video i don't know who to trust anymore okay i'm gonna end up there make sure to subscribe for more and i will see you in the next video bye bye